This is the podcast for December 13th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we're pretty sure every single Trump supporter at DJ's Diner has been interviewed at least twice. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. House Judiciary Committee voted articles of impeachment this morning. Really? Yeah. Must have missed that. No, you didn't. You okay. came in the living room, turned on the TV and said, thought you'd want to watch this. And yeah. so I watched it. Yeah. The vote was along party lines and uh, ser- several Republicans left in quite a huff afterwards. Well, as long as they left, I don't care what vehicle they used. <laughs> well, and this is the only real point I want to make about this today. Allison Hanschel on yes. Twitter, she's the brilliant Athena at First Draft. First Draft, who I've met in real life. I've had we have met at her, her in place. real life. Yeah, she's had lunch. I've had lunch with her yeah. and with she's you. She's amazing. She's amazing. And yeah, she's brilliant. She's also and, a real reporter, an actual mm-hmm. shoe leather journalist type reporter. And she had a series of tweets that, without permission, I'm going to read on the air of our podcast. I hope she doesn't mind. And I think she's I think Ooh. she's brilliant. And I think this is what needs to be said. Go for it, baby. She says the purpose of impeachment is not to chasten Donald Trump or to make his supporters see reason or to entertain anybody or to do anything but remedy a criminal in office. So what effect it has on Trump is utterly irrelevant. Stop expecting this to be easy. Stop expecting him to behave. Stop asking for your work to be done for you by someone who has never worked a day in his life and doesn't intend to start now. For God's sake, stop waiting and pick up an axe. Trump is not going to get rid of himself. The GOP is not going to come to its senses. The white racists who cheer our self-destructive bullying culture are not going to change. And every second you sit back hoping for them to act is a second you're wasting. You are going to feel so much stronger and better when you realize that it's up to you and you alone to save the people on either side of you every single day. Because yeah, that means you got to work. But that also means you get to work. You don't have to wait anymore. Bravo. I love that. And that's Bravo. really all I have to really, I that's mean, we're I not doing a news roundup no. this week. The, the news this week is impeachment. I do recommend that people go and watch Adam Schiff's interview with Stephen Colbert. Oh, okay. Uh, he was on Stephen Colbert Thursday night uh, for a long uh, segment. Mm-hmm. And it was very refreshing because Adam Schiff remained Adam Schiff. He was very unemotional mm-hmm. and not uh, interested in a whole lot of... Uh, silliness he d- he didn't he sort of sat there and enjoyed it as an observer but was there to go through the gate of congress and sort of reach out to average people who may not be watching this 24/7 it was good to see that and it was good to see him say the one thing he said that i just stood up and applauded was i'm really not interested in what uh my republican colleagues want to tell me behind the scenes anymore yeah I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. he just said, I'm I'm really not interested in hearing from them off the record. They're very any, brave. Anymore. They're yeah. very brave in the bathroom. They're right. very brave right. in the bathroom. Yeah. As long as they check under the stalls to make sure no one's listening. Well, apparently they did They did that more uh, a couple of years ago Yeah, <laughs> when they were in power, when they had yeah. the house, you yeah. know, but now they're just not. He's not interested. So, you see, you, you know Adam Schiff as Adam Schiff, but this week um, I wrote up Kathleen Parker, who uh-huh. saw a very different – because Kathleen Parker has now um, uh, regressed to the both siders mean. Yes. Uh, because eventually that's where all the scumbags end up. All the all the quizlings, all the apologists, all the weaklings, all the cowards end up in the both sides do it bin. And so this week she decided to tell everyone that – both sides are behaving poorly in the impeachment. Alas, uh, it's it's just terrible. And her description was 
Mother Superior Nancy Pelosi, the prim and purse-lipped Adam Schiff, and grumpy scoldmeister Gerald Nadler. Oh, Lord. Because, you know, why actually do a job of journalism when you can just sit there, collect a check, and be the biggest douche in America by saying, it's just so mean on both sides. I mean, yeah. you risk nothing. You got nothing to lose. No one's going to fire you because that's the party line. Well, that is, Drift Glass, a perfect introduction to our interview. Yes, it is. With Jay Rosen. So let's go on to that. And this week, we are honored to welcome Mr. Jay Rosen, who has been thinking deeply and writing prolifically about media for decades. He's been on the journalism faculty at New York University since 1986 and was the chair of that department from 1999 to 2005. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Salon, Harper's, and The Nation. Uh, Jay is probably best known to lay people like us as the author of the Press Think blog on, quote, the fate of the press in the digital era and the challenges involved in rethinking what journalism is today, which won the Reporters Without Borders Freedom Blog Award in 2005. Welcome, Jay Rosen. Thank you very much, Blue Gallon Drift Glass. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for sending. This is uh, our normal podcast is part chat, and then we do a news roundup and other stuff. So, but today seems like a really good day and like the worst possible day to discuss <laughs> the media and mm. the, the part the press plays in the current political drama we're seeing all around us, uh, how we got here, um, where we are now and where we are headed, uh, uh, which I think is a pretty dire and scary direction, but that's the perils of reading science fiction. I suppose the future mm -hmm. is always looking dystopian. Mm. Um, you were good enough to send us along three articles, which you wrote over the space of six years, and mm -hmm. which cover a lot of your vocabulary and philosophy, and it's sort of ramped up to the present moment. And the uh, the, la the very last one on the list uh, ends six weeks before the 2016 election. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, at your at your leisure, I'd like to go over your approach to media during that period, sort of, you, you know, the, as the event horizon approaches, you started getting more and more specific and explicit. And I would fair to say alarmed about the direction media was taking That's and true. where we are now. So. Sure. But before you do that, can I just sure. make a comment about a term you, uh, you used in your introduction, which is yes. the media. Oh, mm. fair enough. Yeah. We'd love uh, that. Yeah. I don't I don't usually use that term. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but I try to avoid using that construction. And the reason is that I believe that the media, let's say with a capital T or you know, the way that people use it, um, it is for the most part a, a, a fiction. It's like a it's like a mythical object mm. uh, that um people can rage at. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to point out that the media doesn't have an address. Like if you landed as a Martian and said, take me to the media, uh, you wouldn't mm -hmm. actually know where to take the Martian um, Fair be enough. because it's it's an abstraction and um, – People conjure it up in whatever shape they want to beat on it, essentially. Uh, so mm -hmm. I I try to use the term the press or I talk about newsrooms or news organizations um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the press is the term that actually connects us backward in political time to the founding of the republic and to the constitution. The constitution doesn't say anything about freedom of mm -hmm. media. Uh, and the press is, uh, even though it's backward facing term and refers um, to an era in communication where the printing press was the dominant medium, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's good to stay connected to that uh, tradition. So I just want to inject that, that the media to me is what people mention when they want to express rage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That That's seems a fair. really good point. That um, seems very fair. Yeah. Um, so if, if I were to use the locution, the American political journalism, would that, would that Yeah, I, I talk a lot about that. I say political journalists in the United States, mm -hmm. the political press, um, the profession of political journalism, those kinds of okay. things are much better uh, nouns than the media. What, what, about, what about geography then? 
because sometimes you will hear, you know, the coastal elites, you'll hear that word used in interchangeably mm-hmm. with the media. Uh, one yeah. of the one of the things that we on this podcast point out is that is distinctive is we are in South Central Illinois. Right. We're not even near Chicago. <laughs> we're we're really walking distance from a cornfield making yeah. this uh, weekly podcast. So, uh, and we feel very alienated from mm-hmm. Manhattan media. Our, you know, our, cable mm-hmm. news. Our uh, journalistic sure. betters, you should say. <laughs> well, certainly how our far, journalistic paid betters. <laughs> yeah. How far are you from Urbana? That's where I've been in Central Oh, uh, Urbana is about 90 minutes away. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, fair it's, we're, south of, we're south of Urbana. South we're in of Springfield. Okay. We're in the mm-hmm. state capital. So, okay. The, uh, yeah. the, first, the first Republican president's buried about two miles from this house. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we okay, plan well, to hold a funeral for the Republican Party <laughs> at that spot any day now. But. <laughs> To get back to your question, the national press is an institution of its mm-hmm. own, and mm-hmm. it has headquarters, as we know, in mm-hmm. New York and, and uh, Washington with some outliers perhaps in Boston or L.A. or Chicago. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it has a unique geography. And, and then the local press is, is different, but there are connections between – the local press and the national press, like for example, yes. the career path in journalism, mm-hmm. right? It mm-hmm. takes you mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. one to another. But yes, these are distinct uh, institutions, and what might be said about national journalism is not always the case for local journalism. And the decay of local journalism is an important thing in the national context, as you know. So we just have to right. try to keep some of those complications in mind. Right. Because when we talk about cable news, for instance, that is an entirely different structure yes. and power power base than basically anything else. So, okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the reasons that I don't like the term the media is that very often the practical ter- meaning of the term media is what I saw in cable news last night said I hate it. Right. Yeah. That, that's what it really mm-hmm. means. Yeah. And, th- and that's mm-hmm. not really mm-hmm. a very strongly analytical concept. We have a local newspaper that is in a death spiral. Mm-hmm. It's down to nothing. It's uh, editor quit seven or eight months ago and hoped that her salary would be used to keep reporters on. There's maybe three and a half reporters working there. It's a big mm-hmm. empty shell of a building just bought by Gatehouse Media. One of the worst, yeah. yeah. And the thing about it is, as a local newspaper in Trump country, they do tend to be extraordinarily um, bent in the direction of making sure that uh, no one is offended by their coverage of politics. So yeah. recently they they, uh, um, they they sponsored an indoor-outdoor festival with noted outdoorsman uh, Ted Nugent. Never mentioned Ted Nugent's political affiliations, never mentioned him talking about assassinating people, just talked about what a, a darn – this is the editor of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also syndicate Ann Coulter, and they also write columns lecturing us on the importance of civility at the same mm-hmm. time. So mm-hmm. there seems mm-hmm. to be a certain amount of shared DNA between our local newspaper and the New York Times and Meet the Press, for example. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, and, and and that's an indication that there is such a thing as the profession of journalism, and it stretches across uh, from your Springfield local newspaper with three reporters to meet the press. Yeah, absolutely. There and there are, there are shared ideas and assumptions, and that's why I call my blog Press Think. You know, it's about that. It's yeah. about Press Think is like a version of Group mm-hmm. Think, right? Uh, so there there are ideas and. Uh, and starting points and rituals that connect the press at the local level to the national level, even though they are still distinct institutions. And so how should one approach critiquing this sort of multi-headed institution that seems to, in my opinion, very distinctively has gone wildly off the rails when it comes to what I believe their mission statement is way down deep, which is reporting important issues to the public so the public can make informed decisions. Mm-hmm. They, they don't seem to be able to sort of muster the, the necessary internal fortitude to do that on, on a local or national level. And that's deeply troubling to me since that is the one institution we have that's, that's chartered by the First Amendment and mm-hmm. that conducts our public square discussions of politics. The frame for discussion seems to be skewed so hard right 
that there's just no way to get it back to a place where we can actually have a discussion about what's really facing our country and the threat that's right in front of us. Mm -hmm. So um, how did we get here? (laughs) (laughs) He said by way of of uh eliding over to your uh to your articles uh and how do we get out of here yeah well those are big and complex questions and they deserve you know books of their own um and i've spent a lot of time over the last um 15 16 years i started my blog in 2003 um trying to write about about why that has had things like that have happened um and Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the answers is that the political press went off track at a certain point. Whenever you say something like that, somebody immediately jumps in and says, oh, so there's a golden age. And I'm not saying there was a golden age. And I'm not <laughs> saying that things were better before. And I have to, I, and, right. and if I was going to give a mm-hmm. full list of disclaimers, that would like take 15 minutes. But um, at a certain point, I think the profession of political journalism mm-hmm. took – a wrong turn, and it began to focus on the professional political class and the maneuvering of that class far more than um, than it focused on the country, let's say, or or what was happening in the country. And uh, Joan Didion's essay for the New York Review of Books back in the eighties uh, that was called Insider Baseball um, gets at this very mm-hmm. well. It's a classic text that's about this part of the story Um, and uh, in attaching itself to the professional political class, uh, political journalists began to get super interested in, in the game of politics. This is is what you call the church of the savvy, right? Yes. And so I developed my own vocabulary for talking about this because I didn't think it was being talked about very well. Um, So this is what I call the savvy style, the church of the savvy in political journalism. And it, as I said, it focuses on the professional political class. It, it tries to be uh, quote unquote realistic about candidates and proposals and the parties. It likes to talk about um, things like the tactics that uh, politicians are using and the strategy of the parties. Um, And, uh, and of course, uh, journalists focused on on this need sources in both parties and both sides Mm -hmm. and they're the they're the people who are showing up at the des moines marriott three years before the election to have drinks with the you know county chairman just so that when the next cycle comes around they already have um uh connections to the people on the ground who can help them report the inside story so part of the answer is that the savvy style overtook political journalism to become the dominant style. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that happened over a period of, of decades. So you can start to see the problem when you realize that the press attached itself to the professional political class, and then the professional political class began to detach itself from the yes. country. You can see how that would create a it problem. It creates a, a sort of free-floating bubble of self-referential glory. Right. Uh, in which – and – as the country, and this is something we really do notice sort of on the ground here and talking to people. Uh, I, I don't work in journalism, but I've worked an awful lot of different jobs. And I've, and, and I've talked to an awful lot of Republicans in my family, colleagues, et cetera. And over the last, you know, put a pin in a map, everyone always argues about when this started. But let's, 30 years ago, mm-hmm. the Republican Party, as it was being reported by the national political press, bears almost no relationship to the Republican Party I know and see every day of my life out here in the real world. I agree with that. And that is a big part of their present crisis. And I, I can understand if you are a bricklayer or you sell used cars and you have goofy opinions about Barack Obama's birth certificate and, I don't know, uh, Vince Foster being murdered. That's fine. That's You get to do that as a citizen in a free country. What started to freak me out was that the national political press didn't seem to care that the stories they were reporting about the Republican Party were getting wronger and wronger and wronger, mm-hmm. despite the fact the data that supported the premise that Republicans are not a bunch of you know chin-stroking, Edmund Burke-quoting fiscal conservatives. They're just not, and they never were. And this kind of 
attitude of, well, we don't really care. The, the people we know, the people we talk to over the back fence all think this. And what's going out in the rest of the country is really not our problem. That's not what we're interested in. And I, I had assumed that that would reach a breaking point at some point. Mm-hmm. Where at some point you just have to acknowledge that the GOP is what it is. And yet even this week in the news, it's just cluttered with both sides this and both sides that in the political brawl and and one side and the other. The same tired tropes they've been sort of using for years to prop up their institutions. And that's what really freaks me out is that if they were innocent of this, if they just didn't know any better, they would discover the problem. Do a lot. What any corporation does when they've gone, presumably, that doesn't want to go out of business, that has discovered something that is drastically wrong with their mission statement. You figure out what's broken and you fix it. The media, which, uh, pardon me, the, the press, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm correcting myself in real time now. The press is, that's supposed to be the one job it actually does. Investigate stuff, figure out what's going on and report it. Yeah. And yet that it's the one job at which they have failed most spectacularly over decades and they don't seem really interested in fixing it at all even though i can't believe they don't realize how broken their institution is and that very long monologue by drift class we have a, <laughs> we have shorthand for that on our podcast we do. It, we do. It, the, the shorthand for that is david brooks's line it's gonna be rubio it's yeah. gonna be rubio it's gonna be rubio, <laughs> gonna be rubio. don't <laughs> worry don't worry it's gonna be rubio <laughs> Mm-hmm. When did he say that? That was well, his and, understanding uh, of the Republican yeah. Party and what it yeah. was all about. And he was spectacularly wrong in that very specific instance. But it feeds from an entire career of writing Whig fan fiction about the yeah, Republican Party. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of views on this, as you might imagine. One is the title of the one of the pieces I sent you is – Asymmetry between the major political parties fries the circuits of the mainstream press. Yeah. We and love that one. Yes, I just want to yeah. repeat it because yeah. that it's a very important <laughs> idea for me and and what and my criticism. And asymmetry between the major parties fries the circuits of the mainstream press. And so what I'm trying to get at there is that the mental picture of Two political parties that are roughly similar in their structure but have different philosophies. You know, one believes in uh, using government to make the, the world better, and the other is skeptical about too much government interference. And one wants to tax people more to pay for government services, and one is more frugal with taxes. That image was something they built their profession yes, on. Mm-hmm. They, and p- individual people, like Mark Halperin, for example, built their careers on that mental picture. And many of them did very well in Washington by doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were able to generate a kind of cultural capital that they could shift around from one employer to another. This is a really interesting part of the story. Um if there is a uniform style in political journalism that stretches from the cable channels to the big news- newspapers to Time Magazine to PBS to the NBC Evening News, then you have a bigger field of employers for when you want to move around and, and get paid more money. Halpern did this. He went from Time Magazine to mm-hmm. Bloomberg to – there was like three or four others in there. And so – uh, an entire institution and uh, people's careers, people's livelihoods are built on a a kind of understanding of American politics that became less and less true mm-hmm. every year. Now, if it becomes less and less true every year, you have this problem of when do you actually call time out and say, wait, we can't keep doing this because every year what we're reporting is a little more false. It's It's one of those problems where you can ignore it. Um, every year because it's gotten just a little bit worse. Um, but uh, – and this is something that I'm trying to write now and it's always difficult to talk about something that you're trying to write. But a, a moment of, of, of no return came in 2012 when um, mm-hmm. Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein published their book, mm-hmm. which is about this. Yes. Right, right. Yes. 
Well, and th- this is the uh, the technical debt that you also talked yeah, about. Yeah, it's that's I a different believe. concept, which which I could also explain if I, if you want me to. But in, mm-hmm. I felt that when when or- Norm Arnstein and Thomas Mann, and you have to understand who they were to understand this point, came out with this book as well as an op ed that mm-hmm. said, "Look, the Republican Party is the problem. Mm-hmm. They are." An insurgent yes. Yes. outlier, ideologically extreme, unmoved by common notions of, of evidence or facts, um, and mm-hmm. anti-professional too, in the sense that they overrode the understandings of uh, experts and civil servants and so forth. Um, when they came out with that, that was the moment that the Washington press had to step back and say, wow, this has really changed. This is something different. We our, yes. our model didn't yes, account for this. We don't really have a way of coping with this. But instead, what they did was kind of pretend <laughs> that this never happened. Right. Ma- Man and Ornstein did not appear on Meet the Press. They were not asked to re. Yeah. They were blackballed, uh, weren't they? Yeah. Well, more or less. I mean, yeah. you know, they were excluded yeah. from the national discussion after that. And the fact that that the that the political press would, in a way, do that to one of their own. I say one of their own because um, Norm Ornstein was at one time called, you can look it up by Washington Monthly, the king of quotes. Wow. Yeah. Because he was yeah. the most quoted person in Washington journalism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how can mm-hmm. you become the most quoted person in Washington journalism? <laughs> well, you have to be known for having a sort of a sober view of both sides, right? You you can't be yeah. straight, straight shooter, shooter, not too yep. extreme, not too mm-hmm. ideological, right? Knows how things work in this town, has been around, sort of a, a veteran, uh, a sage uh, of the city. And both of those guys, one from the American Enterprise Institute, again, establishment think tank, one from Brookings, establishment think tank. You cannot get more establishment figures than these two people. And they were mm-hmm. saying that your mental equipment is busted. The world has changed in a way that um, you are no longer able to make sense of it. And that was the point of no return, not the cause, not the mm-hmm. beginning, uh, not the origin, but the last chance they had – to uh, turn around and start fixing yeah. it, and they declined it. And now here we are. And well, that's and that's a, a very good jumping off point. I'm uh, not not jumping off point, but um, I'm also working through something right now. And you're right; it's really hard to talk about it when you're writing about it. But uh, in my mind, I'm, I'm dividing up um, analysis of the press into the as as if it were the 16th century Catholic or 17th century Catholic Church. There's the period of time when astronomers are compiling data. Tycho Brahe. We're we're, we're observing how the, the universe works. We're making very clear, careful observations about it. And we're noticing that something doesn't work right. And then comes the Galileo portion, where you actually propound a theory that explains the data. And that's when the church comes down on you like the wrath of God. You, mm-hmm. you, you're you saying, what now? You're saying that we're not the center of the universe? And it mm-hmm. took them... 400 years to apologize for that. So at this moment, it appears that the, the evidence is in the, the press is broken and the press has been broken for a very long time. It's been broken in exactly the same way. And it's, it's developed a reflex response to all situations. Um, And that, that part of it is, is sort of well known. What bothers me is that, I don't understand why they maintain this. I don't understand yeah. why the church, the, the what I call the high and holy church of both sides do it, mm-hmm. continues to be the state religion of of the uh, of the press. Because if you work for – if you're Mark Halpern or if you're David Brooks, you work for somebody. You work for the New York Times or you work for Time mm-hmm. Magazine or you work, you work for Comcast. Someone mm-hmm. up the food chain has decided that you need to have your own column. And this lunatic over here who keeps talking about how the, the system is asymmetric should not have their own column. That you should be on Meet the Press every week like Newt Gingrich was during the David Gregory days. But people who propound a different theory should definitely not be anywhere near a microphone. That's mm-hmm. the part where, I, where it's a black box. I do not know why or how the corporations that, that run the press continue to re- create this reward structure where – Sticking to this obviously flawed system 
is still rewarded and continuing to inveigh against it and saying, danger, Will Robinson. We're an, we're an actual existential threat here. We have to stop doing this, which is the, the end point of your 2016 article, which was the press needs to be uh, different. They need to approach this differently or we're all in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what to make of that other than I, I've worked for companies that were dysfunctional and corporate culture usually came from a handful of people at the very top of the organization who controlled the budgets and hired and fired people. And I don't know that the, the press is that much different in, in, in the sense that it is a business and it rewards certain people and it, it outcasts others. Right. Well, when I use the term the press, I don't exactly mean um, Time mm-hmm, Warner mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. AT&T, which is right. now the owner of CNN, right? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I understand why people go there, but to me, as a professor of journalism, that's not actually a good name for the press. The press is um, the institutions within these companies where – Journalists learn to um, do their work and where Mm -hmm. they carve out a certain degree of autonomy. It's not complete autonomy. It's not a unideological space, but they carve out some uh, space for themselves where the accountants and the CEOs and the board chairs of the companies that own this space aren't telling them what to do Mm -hmm. day to day. So part of the answer for how can this go on is that while the consensus practice of savvy journalism, both parties are roughly similar, we do reporting that lands in the middle, both sides, that that whole worldview is a consensus practice that uh, allows – thousands of people in the institution to be on the same page. It's especially true in broadcast journalism, but it's true in every other kind is you need people to have the same ideas in order to do news work because you're often doing it on deadline under conditions of limited Mm -hmm. knowledge, um, under difficult circumstances, right? And and you don't have time to argue about what your philosophy of journalism is. And so there's a, there's a premium put on (laughs) consensus thinking, as well as consensus practices. Uh-huh. So it's an ideological style book in a, in a sense. Yeah, it's a style book, but it, it, it becomes part of background knowledge that you have as a journalist, yeah. right? So like mm-hmm. w- w- mm-hmm. in my post that I wrote a long time ago, I think it was 2009, about he said, she said journalism. I said, you know, one of the things you understand about he said, she said journalism is that it makes the story writable on deadline – no matter how mm-hmm. much you know, mm-hmm. right. right? If, if right, you don't, right? If you don't know anything about this study that was just released by the EPA, you still know uh, that you should quote the environmentalists about what it said, and then you should quote an industry group about what it said because uh, that's what you do when you have to write the story and you don't actually know anything. So, so a lot of these routines simply make um, – the production work of journalism easier Mm -hmm. and the consensus Mm -hmm. around them is essential for everybody to be on the same page about what they are making so that when the red light goes on at 630, you have a broadcast, right? You have, you have something to do. So that's Mm -hmm. one answer. Mm -hmm. Another answer is that if um, political journalists were to uh, realize that their routines and assumptions are broken because the Republican Party went off in a direction that the Democratic Party did not go in or this, if they acknowledge this asymmetry as this huge factor, Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that would happen is they would have to confront, what are we going to replace our broken system with? And there would be no consensus about that. That's also true. And that would make the work of daily production almost impossible. So if you look at it that way, Um, You can see why they would keep clinging to their routines, even though they know, and a lot of the smarter ones do know, that asymmetry is a real thing. Uh, Like um, uh, Dan Balls. Dan Balls, yeah. Eventually did Mm. write. I think I put it in my piece. You you did, yeah. Yeah. That, you know what? Uh, Tom Mann and Noam Ernstein had a point (laughs) back in 2012. But he wrote that like five years later, right? Right. And he didn't accompany that confession with, and I'm going to change what I'm doing. You see what I mean? Right. Um, And so 
Yeah. It's not that they yeah. don't yeah. know that asymmetry has overtaken the American political system. They do know it. They just don't know what to do once they uh, acknowledge that. That's, that is a big part of the problem. What would happen if they had to acknowledge it? Um, I have a, a, a slightly more maybe cynical motive, which I think goes hand in hand with this, which is the second question that would be asked is, how mm-hmm. long have you been wrong about this? I mean, at that point, you sort of have to acknowledge your complicity. Because one of the props that holds the Republican Party up is that they have this universal all-purpose alibi, which is no matter how bad they get, when yeah. things go bad, they just say, well, you know how both sides are bad. You know both sides right. are bad. And I know that because I read it in the New York Times. So there'd, be half, there'd have to be this acknowledgement that we were yes. part of the problem. We were a really big part of the problem. And there'd have to be some accountability. And I don't think institutions are ready to do that. I would agree with that. Um, I think it's very difficult for an institution to do that. It's very difficult for people at the top of their profession, which these people are, to do that. Um, And if we look at previous moments where such a thing was called for, Mm -hmm. like the fall down in press coverage before the Iraq war, where a phony case for war moved for the political system and was not – uh, subjected to a check by the it press wasn't. or the surprise of the uh, 2007-2008 recession springed upon Americans mm-hmm. uh, y- 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 and the 2016 election, which was debacle for the political press. Mm-hmm. You do not find after these spectacular crashes uh, the uh, profession being called into crisis and considering possible remedies and reflecting on uh, how they screwed up and 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 creating bodies that could deliberate and and fix it because one of the reasons for that is that as soon as these crashes are over you you have the wreckage of them and that's a great story right so yeah. as, <laughs> as soon as the 2016 election was over you have this oh my god now he's president moment and you have to figure out how to cover that. And so you can just sort of like uh, flip from one world to uh, another because it's not possible to call a halt to the news engines and say, We're, mm-hmm. we'll be back in six months when we figure this out. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's another reason is that, they, is that the press has a very poor record of reflection after these crashes. And the crashes could – illuminate sort of like structural failures or, you know, deep seated problems if there was an appetite for that, but there is no appetite. But we have multiple small little crashes every Mm -hmm. other week in the Trump administration when the so-called president says, and I'm going to get this plan out in two weeks. I'm going to have a health care plan in two weeks. I'm going to get Melania's immigration papers out in two weeks. And he seems to know exactly what the attention span is of the press, that they will be on to something else and he will have created some other emergency that they are covering and that there will be zero accountability for his fake promise. And I think yep. that failure is unforgivable. It, it's not as if it's a humongous crash that disrupts everything and you have to cover it because you're up to your earlobes in it. No, he just said two weeks ago that in two weeks he would have a health care plan for you. That Where cuts is every it? Day. Who has yeah. ever asked him that? And I think that failure needs some accountability. Yeah, uh, that is definitely part of it. Um, to understand how wild that is um it it helps to to try and imagine what the the sort of the image of the american president was in the mind of the american press before trump and in the american presidency as the political press began to understand it it was taken for granted for example that um if the president said something that was factually wrong that was a problem and it had to be corrected um, Glenn Kessler has been very um, sharp on this. He has said that before Trump, presidents, Republican and Democrat, when they were f- successfully fact-checked, would do something to adjust. They wouldn't necessarily say, OK, you got me. I just made that up. But they would change it so that it was kind of sort of 
in compliance with the factual record, or they would take that line out of the stump speech. You know, they would do something so that they weren't being penalized repeatedly because the belief was both in the political class and in the in the press that the president couldn't afford that kind of exposure and embarrassment uh, again and again. Right. And and not only does Donald Trump not do that, and like he doesn't correct anything, but he has discovered this kind of like exploit within the journalist's code where he can double down and triple down on those kinds of misstatements, lies, false statements, because the very friction caused by them is an engine for his movement. And that that – strategy, if you want to call it that, is really more of a pattern than a strategy. But that pattern is unthinkable within the press think of the, t- the day of, of, of this current era. And so there's that – and that's just one example of hundreds of things that Trump does that just simply overwhelm the press system. Another one is it, there used to be something that scholars uh, in uh, my field uh, would – were called news management, news management, which was something that White Houses were supposed – and campaigns were supposed to be good at, right, which means um, – Getting your message out by having, for example, a story of the day that you want to push, uh, a, a line of the day that you want to repeat, uh, something that you need to draw attention infrastructure to. Infrastructure week is what you're talking about. The infrastructure week, exactly. <laughs> that's like that's like the, the satire version right. of it. But yeah, inst- infrastructure work would be a great example of that. And in the previous regime of news management, right. you would try not to talk about anything except infrastructure week mm-hmm. and you would try mm-hmm. not to make news on things other than the thing you're trying to spotlight mm-hmm. right right and that's how you that's how you did it in campaigns and then the journalists would come along mm-hmm. and they would like laugh at you if you weren't able to have enough discipline to focus on your message right and they would take apart your message and and uh and try and uh analyze whether it was savvy enough and 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 Trump, not only he doesn't do that, he he can't stick to a message. He overwhelms mm-hmm. the system with news. He makes news in a negative way almost every time he opens his mouth. He mm-hmm. he disregards any advice he might give. He has no discipline whatsoever. And his way of controlling the news is by making too mm-hmm. much of it. Again, there's nothing in the press playbook about that. There's no instructions for what to do in that situation. Mm-hmm. Is it my imagination or – is the White House press corps particularly docile? I think that's. I realize that's a very loaded question. <laughs> I think the White House press corps is is um, highly ritualized. Uh-huh. It is um, sold on the proposition that its space within the White House both. Literally, like the the press room itself, mm-hmm. but also mm-hmm. the concept that the press has like a workspace, a home within the White House, and that it is in a way part of the presidency. Ah, those ideas are deeply woven into the minds of the people who make it that far. Yep, and um, they they even have an institution, the WHCA, the yep. White House Correspondents Association, which exists t- to uh, defend and and perpetuate those ideas. I I think the White House press corps is particularly besotted with this idea of, it's not just access. It's like that we are part of the presidency as an institution. I see. And now they're part of the presidency, but as a hate object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and again, there's nothing in the playbook about what to do then. Well, it used to be, I think in, in one of your articles you sent along, you mentioned Ed Henry, I might be getting this wrong, who dined out on, getting a zinger in at Barack Obama and like Mm -hmm. his body language changed and he clenched his jaw and he, and, and he, and, and he bragged about the fact that I got in this dig and made him tense up and made Mm -hmm. him bark at me. And that Mm -hmm. was, that was sort of this weird ritual where something that as in the perspective of the post Trump election is so enormously trivial um, that nobody cares about it out here in the real world. Mm-hmm. But it was a it was a uh, it was a point of pride and currency sure. inside the press corps. 
Totally. Uh, and there are as many things like that that are kind of internal to the profession um, that end up becoming motivators for actors within that system. Uh, there's a, a habit, I'm sure you've noticed it, that once the administration of the country changes, the previous administration ceases to exist historically. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. there is just there there never was a Barack Obama. And the minute Barack Obama put his hand on the Bible, the Bush administration disappeared off the face of the earth and no one knows whatever happened to it. And for those of us who actually one of the um, one of our mottos of our of our little blog and podcast here is uh, memory is the liberal superpower. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have the nerve and the, I think, burden of actually remembering that there was a convention called in Washington by leadership in the Republican Party the day Barack Obama was inaugurated to figure out the most effective way of kneecapping his administration. Mm -hmm. And that was the strategy, that this is this is something that was known, it, it, the strategy that was executed quite efficiently by the Republican Party, and that that was a real thing that really happened. And it's it's almost like talking about the Battle of Hastings. These things are so distant and dim in the past that no one quite remembers the details of them. And yet when you sort of bring them up into the present, uh, bring them to the 2016 election, for example, um, I would contend that there was an almost herd immunity among the press corps about Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Since it was clear she was going to win, there was just no doubt that she was going to win against this buffoon. It was perfectly safe to use her as a pinata. It was perfectly safe to to just bag on her, uh, and every Donald Trump scandal was and her emails. It didn't matter what Donald Trump did; you had to tag that story with, and of course, Hillary Clinton, the email scandal, and mm -hmm. it, it just went on and on and on like that. And the people who were the savvy ones, I'm thinking specifically of uh, Matthew Dowd, for example, and Ron Fournier, mm -hmm. who were making the rounds during the 2016 election saying one thing and one thing only, and that is the corrupt duopoly is the problem. The, the system is the problem. Both sides are the problem. Both parties are to blame. I'm voting independent. I'm going to, I'm not, I think they're both terrible because there was this sense that nothing could really go drastically wrong. It, it couldn't be that bad. I mean, that somewhere out there, some responsible authority would step in, make sure that Hillary Clinton got elected. And then we could go back to business as usual, which is, you know, attacking Democrats for being tax and spend and, and watching her and Mitch McConnell fight. And they just sort of let that happen because they, were, they knew it was perfectly safe. They knew the institutions would protect them. And when the institutions collapsed and there was no – no one came to save them, they didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And in that sense, their world after two, 2016 kind of lie in ruins. <laughs> one of the things I noticed I'd like your opinion about. Now that their world is in ruins, they have started inviting people into the circle of trust on cable news. But most of those people tend to be Charlie Sykes and Rick Wilson mm -hmm. and Tom Nichols mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Kristol, uh, the wrongest man in American political history. And yeah. so the, the place where I think the liberals should be. The Democrats should be, the people who've been watching and listening to the press, the Jay Rosen should be, <laughs> the people who've been watching and listening to the media uh, go down this wrong path for years. Those seats are being taken up by former Republican ad writers, former Republican campaign managers, former Republican this, former Republican radio hosts who suddenly discovered five minutes ago the Republican Party's full of Republicans. And I, I see that as almost an extension of we don't want to acknowledge the asymmetry between the two parties. So we're going to have on the right, we're going to have Republicans. On the left, we're going to have Charlie Sykes. And that's where we're going to conduct our debate from now on. Well, um, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would explain it a little bit differently. The, um, okay. Uh, a term that I have, I've tried to use for this, it hasn't really caught on because it is kind of academic um, – is the production of innocence, right? Mm, so mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing that's really important to understand about our political press is that alongside the regular production of news stories and columns and analysis pieces and 
and panels and roundtables, alongside the production of journalism, they are constantly involved in another manufacture, which is of their own innocence, uh, mm -hmm. meaning uh, we don't have any politics ourselves. We don't have uh, a stake in this. We don't have an interest. We don't have an ideology. We don't have a philosophy. Uh, we are just telling you the way it is, which is the which is the standard way the American press tries to generate trust. Now, there are all kinds of uh, problems with that uh, system, but w w the way that they kind of identify themselves and gain a professional foothold is by pushing off from both sides. That's, that's why mm -hmm. Butter emails was so important, because not, not because they wanted to get Hillary Clinton. I don't think that's the way they right. think. Instead, they were aware that because of the crazy things Trump was doing and the wild exaggerations and lies and falsehoods that he was floating, they had to uh, point out those things. As soon as they point out those things, now they have a problem because they have like a deficit on mm -hmm. one side. So they have to figure out how to how to find something on the other side that they can also point to and criticize. And and this way of creating a professional identity is basic to the way political journalism operates. And so this is this is uh, Jeff Zucker's entire uh, programming philosophy, yeah. right? Yeah. Is we're not MSNBC and we're not Fox mm -hmm. and we're right down the middle. And at one point they even developed that into like one of their uh, ad campaigns and one of their slogans, which was the only side we're on is yours. Yeah. Right. So, and that was an mm -hmm. actual slogan, mm -hmm. I think in like 2012 from, from CNN. Um, and so that is usually what's happening is that they're, they're intuitively sensing that if they keep going with this truth, it will create this kind of imbalance that won't feel or sound innocent. And so in order to recover their innocence, they have to push off from the other side, often by taking something rather small or normal and inflating it into something big. Um, and that's how you get butter emails. That, that is asymmetrical – when it comes to things like Medicare for all, because yes. you will see people in the press pushing back on Medicare for all in terms of who will pay for it. How will people, you know, miss out on choice in healthcare? And there, there, there's these right wing talking points about making sure that there are objections to Medicare for all. They're all policy based. Yeah. And there is not a search. There is not a search on the other side for, and now we're going to talk about uninsured children in Ohio. Now we're mm -hmm. going to talk about uninsured children in the South and the states where people have not, when we're Republicans, only one party, both sides don't. Only Republicans have refused to expand Medicaid. There is this huge number of uninsured working people. And there is mm -hmm. not a pushback, there is not a search even for a, well, we have to find the other side, the way you talked about butter emails. We found that. There is not a search for that. And I, I have to imagine that the reason for that is they are invested in personally and professionally and also their organizations are invested in big pharma. Their advertising budgets depend on insurance companies and big pharma. They're, you know, I, that is the only thing that I see being a logical reason for their behavior. They're well, not searching for something to push off from their concerns about universal health care. I, at the corporate level, that might be so. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. the level of professional journalists, it's more likely that they are, they s interpret their own behavior as some sort of, search for a balance. But as Norm Ornstein and Thomas Mann said, and another brilliant um, construction of theirs, a balanced view of an unbalanced phenomenon distorts mm -hmm. reality. Right. And right. This is something right. I've repeated yeah. many times online because it's so important, mm -hmm. but it um, you can see how that kind of distortion, where the distortion is bunching towards the center of a situation that's actually very schizoid and asymmetrical, mm -hmm. right? That kind mm -hmm, of distortion mm -hmm. is easy to disguise because it's, it appears 
as on the one hand, on the other hand, as both sides mm-hmm. do it, as right, it sounds very savvy in that way. Um, so I think that is that is also going on there. I don't think journalists worry too much about advertisers because their self image okay. is as people who don't do that. But and so they get caught in these other traps that might have the same result. But what they're mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. is they're following professional rituals that are mm-hmm. are um, that are enforced across the entire institution. Here's a little example I think is interesting about this. Um, nobody else thinks this is significant. This is one of the uh, joy, <laughs> the joys of my life as I get stuck on these things and nobody else even notices them. But the fact that we have a debate partners. Politico and PBS amazes yeah. me. Yeah. How can you have an, an institution that's supposed to be public broadcasting for the public as a whole mm-hmm. teaming up with a tip sheet for political insiders, which is what Politico is, right? Yeah. Nobody thinks that's the stra- right. a slightest bit strange mm-hmm. when, from my point of view, if we had real public broadcasting, yeah. the people on it would look at politics in a completely different way mm-hmm. than the insiders who basically make their living from the game of politics, which is what Politico, to its credit, has captured, mm-hmm. right? It's, Politico is very good at what it does, mm-hmm. and it right. definitely knows its audience. Mm-hmm. Does public broadcasting know what's on? And the fact that journalists can like move across these institutions and basically not change a thing they're doing yeah. tells you that there, there's something else in charge there, even beyond the ownership. You see what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, there's a profession that has captured yep. this activity and it instructs the people in it regardless of where they're working. Well, and what about the uh, a simple proposition that the – the, the, one of the terms that's flying around now, thanks to impeachment, is consciousness of guilt. Mm-hmm. Um, these yeah, I've act- seen that. Yeah, the, the, the actions taken to to wedge in um, a both sides uh, qualifier into everything you write, so mm-hmm. not you personally, but everything I you know, I can randomly pick out any op ed, stick my finger in it, and there is someone saying, "There's Hugh Hewitt or there's Kathleen Parker or someone saying, but you know, Democrats are just as bad." And it's <laughs> it's so weirdly ritualized. It's so obviously out of place and mm-hmm. in such bad faith, nakedly bad faith. It might have yep. worked in the 80s or 90s, but now it's just stupid. I mean, I don't know who believes that. There seems to be this terrified. They're just terrified, not just that the um, their, their, their religion, their faith, their theology has collapsed, but that if they acknowledge – What's really going on? If they start talking about the real world, which is a third of this country is out of its mind. A third of this country has 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 been brainwashed or voluntarily brainwashed by a, a conservative media. I will say media because it's all terribly well coordinated to the point where they don't believe in reality anymore. And they mm-hmm. can be led around by the nose and whatever, as I've said before, I'll keep this polite because we've been polite. Whatever Sean Hannity craps into their skull today comes out of their mouth tomorrow. There's just – there's no higher brain function going on there at all anymore. And you can see it reflected in their elected officials. You can see it reflected in the White House. If journalists were to acknowledge that that really has happened in this country and we are really in trouble, the consequences of that are terrifying. Yes, because they are. it would automatically put a moral burden on everyone involved to pick a side because now you have to really pick a side. There's no, there's no middle anymore where you can straddle. There's no, there, you can go a thousand miles and never find a fence big enough to straddle to straddle this problem. And that is something they, that people who want to sell their product, who want to be welcomed into people's homes, <laughs> you know, read over the morning uh, cereal, don't want to put in the middle of someone's day, which is, by the way, we're having a cold civil war. A third of this country is out of their mind and is wrecking this country, and you have to do something about it now. Yeah, I think that's more or less accurate. Um, Bob, uh, I mean, uh, Carl Bernstein does call what 
we are experiencing a cold civil war every time he's done yeah. uh, reliable sources, um, mm-hmm. which is CNN. Uh, so it's not that these thoughts can't be broached every once in a while. They can. Um, and you're right. The consequences are terrifying. But I would go a little bit further than you, than you do in, in this Ooh. respect. Okay. That one third of the country, which might be 30 percent, might be between 25 and 30 percent. But let's say it's mm-hmm. a third. Um, a third of the country has now been um, isolated in an information I mean, information loop of mm-hmm. its own where Trump is mm-hmm. or his surrogates are the major source of information about mm-hmm. Trump, which is an authoritarian news system up and running for one third of yep. the country, mm-hmm. which also means that before they log on in the morning – Mainstream journalists have to face the fact that a third of their public is already gone before they make their first yes. phone call. Yes. And you can imagine how mm-hmm. scary mm-hmm. that thought is because what happens if that 30% gets up to 40%, mm-hmm. right? What happens when it starts creeping towards 50%, which is where it's going, right? When you look at, uh, for example, um, the mm-hmm. trust numbers and uh, party divisions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think – I think there's a there's an enormity to our crisis. There's a, there's a collapse of uh, foundations that is too big to look at, and I, I and that is definitely one of the major themes of uh, politics and journalism since November of 2016. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's a that's a very um depressing mm-hmm. headline to put on this podcast, but a problem so significant that we're not going to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. And, because it's mm-hmm. too big. It, it mm-hmm. overwhelms too many things at once. Um, you can't get your mind around it. And, and, and if you did get your mind around it, the next question would be, okay, what does that mean for our daily practice? And then everything would fall apart. Yeah. Now you can't even do the news. You couldn't even like, get out of your office. One of the things that we talk about here is the thought of burning the lifeboats, which is to not allow this one third of the country with us having the hope that Donald Trump will be exposed and defeated and removed from office and so forth. And that as happened with George W. Bush, there will be an awakening that, oh, my God, we have to move on and change things. And and what mm-hmm. happened after Bush was we had a rebranding of the Tea Party, you know, that and it was very well funded. It had a spokesperson in Glenn Beck who rallied everyone around his tears and concern for America. And Dick Army. And yes. Dick Army was was finding the funding for that. And, and they put on silly hats and became something that the me the press treated mm-hmm. as a brand new political movement. These were not Bush voters. These were Tea Partiers. And so mm-hmm. we have had this this movement or trying to start a movement of burn the lifeboats of no rebranding after Trump goes down. Don't allow, uh, particularly don't allow a wealthy movement uh, coming in organically from the press and from the media and from a, a, or at least from people that are media managers, as you could put it, mm-hmm. come in mm-hmm. and try to brand a new movement that then erases Trumpism yeah. which I, we are, I wrote in 2016, don't you dare call it Trumpism. Uh, but I, but what you're saying, I wonder if uh, allowing an mm. out is sort well, of the pressure valve that prevents the yeah. Cold Civil War from becoming a hot civil war. I know I, Drift Glass does not want to forgive these people, and I don't either. <laughs> it, it's it's not a matter of that. It's It's a matter of, Um, I don't know if you're a fan of Kurt Vonnegut. I'm a big fan of Kurt Vonnegut. Um, Uh He has a phrase called a grand falloon. And a grand falloon is a proud and meaningless association of people like Hoosiers. Um, And right after the collapse of the Bush administration and the uh, the election of Barack Obama, suddenly uh, David Brooks got really interested in the sudden rise in independence. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> my goodness uh, every republican i knew was suddenly why are you calling me a republican i'm an independent i'm a constitutional conservative i had nothing to do with that never heard of george bush don't know who his name is and to his frankly i i i think he made a huge mistake barack obama who i uh, voted for twice and supported and vetted when he was running mm-hmm. for congress in chicago and think the world of decided that we're going to look forward we're going to look ahead. We're not yeah. going to relitigate what happened during the Bush administration. 
And the only lesson I know that Republicans learn from this is, holy shit, we can get away with murder. We can do anything. And, and no matter what we do, um, the institutions that are supposed to protect this country from us will let us get away with it as long as we pretend we had nothing to do with it because they were so deeply complicit in the disaster. Once we start pointing fingers, um, they're going to have some explaining to do too, and they really don't want to do that. So from my point of view, we've already had two or three cycles of disaster and then pretend it never happened and let them off the hook. Disaster, mm. let them off the hook. Disaster, let them off the hook. And I – I fear that if we teach them that lesson one more time, uh, President Tom Cotton will be the end mm -hmm. of this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, although I write about politics and I make no secret that I have my own political views, I don't actually advise people in politics about what to do. I don't actually <laughs> – I, I, don't, I don't really – I'm not a political writer. I could be, but I'm – that's not mm -hmm. my thing. As I try mm -hmm. to keep, I try to keep my focus but, very, very narrow and only and only talk about what I really know about. But I sure. will say this about uh, it, which coheres with what you're saying. Every four years, uh, I think it's in December, so it's going to be coming up soon uh, next year. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's this conference at Harvard uh, where the managers of the major candidates' political campaigns right. and the journalists who covered the campaign get together and and sort of like do a debrief. And the 2016 right? one was very contentious. I do remember that. It was that. contentious. Yeah. The, well, the part that was contentious was they always have a public event attached to it where there's like a panel mm -hmm. and people can come um, from the public and, and listen to these sage observers. Um, and, and something happened at the um, – at the public part of it, where some Republicans were really upset by the uh, Trump campaign, got up and like yelled at the managers of the Trump campaign. But what mm -hmm. I'm talking about is most of the event is behind closed doors. Hmm. It's not it's not public. Uh, and the journalists and the campaign managers get together. And it's one of these rituals, very much like the, the um, White House Correspondents Association dinner, uh, mm -hmm. like uh -huh. the um, – the annual Christmas party in the White House where the journalists are invited, where the, the fiction of the event is that, you know, we, we have our differences and we have our tussles, yeah. but we're basically in the same business. And mm. once in a while we get together and we kind of adjust our understandings of one another so that we can go on to the next cycle. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, and sure. that's what that event at Harvard is really about. The public event that you were referencing is, mm -hmm. is sort of like the icing on the cake. Right. Now I know about this event. I've heard about it. I re I've read about it. Sometimes like things that happen at the event leak out, even though it's off the record. Um, and I am a former fellow of the Kennedy School of Government in 1994. Uh -huh. uh, I mm -hmm. was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center, which is part of the Kennedy School, and I have asked to be allowed into this event and, and, uh -huh. and i'm a scholar uh -huh. like i write about this right this is this is right. i am a university professor this is a university event and i cannot get wow. into it i cannot oh. i cannot wow. get into this event because it is for the insiders yep. and yeah. and in, this is a way in which the journalists admit that they are uh, insiders, and if if Trump wins in uh, 2020, which I think is definitely mm -hmm. possible, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you can you imagine being in the same room as the managers of his campaign as a journalist and kind of sort of saying, "Okay, so what was that whole thing yeah. about?" Yeah. You know, it's it's obscene. Yeah. It's totally obscene. Yeah. But, yes, but but the profession is not ready to abandon these kind of rituals, which we see every day, and 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 that's what makes me so frustrated. Thank you so much for your time. And and hopefully we'll be able to talk again. I'd love to talk more about the privilege of journalism and walking into the White House, being in that White House press room, walking into the CNN headquarters and every day having to tell yourself it is a privilege to be here and how that colors 
everything that you do. It is, absolutely. That's a huge factor, huge factor. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And I will try not to say the media from now on, but I can't make any promises in that regard. (laughs) No, I think think you changed that. Yeah. I'm I'm inside your head already. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Thank Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay, very much. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye for now. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is half and half, and half and half has a face that's half and half. It's half torty and half black and adorable. Isn't and this first- a Star Trek episode? <laughs> I think With so. Frank Gorshin? I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> Just pretty sure. sure. <laughs> and of course, half and half demands freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Now, we've had uh, people on both sides of the argument as to whether I should continue to sing. And the people that say I should continue to sing the freshly poured jingle uh, want it for their children. So um, I'm not going to say no. Why don't you sing it this time? Freshly poured. Freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. There you go. There we go. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. We love Christmas cards. We love holiday and New Year's cards, too. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service, Go Postal Unions, Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are busy reading Press Think by Jay Rosen and do not wish to be disturbed. Let's think about living. Let's think about about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, loving. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2019-2020. DGBG Productions.